it's always so shocking to us as neurodivergent parents that we have kids. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we're like, how did this happen? Neurodivergence often comes with a splash or more of anxiety. Is it possible for anxiety to be our biggest strength, even as we enter adulthood and even in the workplace? Can we find ways to work with our anxiety instead of against it? Today's guest, Maura Ahrens Neely, is the host of the Anxious Achiever podcast and author of the book by the same name. She's going to help us find ways to rethink our relationship with anxiety right here on episode 177. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. We're coming up on our quarterly AMA episode, and I'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. I'll be answering your questions about anything related to neurodiversity, parenting, education, mental health, and more. Members of our Facebook group are able to submit questions on the AMA posts each month. So if you have a question you'd like answered, be sure to hop on over and join our Facebook group to make your submission. The Facebook group is the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group. Okay, my conversation with Maura Aarons Mealy is up next. When I found the Neurodiversity Podcast, I was really kind of desperate to learn about myself and understand myself. Honestly, I wanted to find like a tribe who I could relate to and feel like I fit in. This podcast brings on guests who seem to be moving neurodiversity more into the mainstream. And Emily Kircher Morris is amazing. I feel like she's talking straight to me. Her knowledge about people who think differently is so refreshing. Everyone's different. And the world needs to understand them. And that's what the Neurodiversity Podcast is doing. Helping them understand us. 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 Today, I'm happy to welcome Maura Ahrens Mealy to the podcast. Maura is the author of the new book, The Anxious Achiever, Turn Your Biggest Fears into Your Leadership Superpower, and host of The Anxious Achiever podcast. So Maura, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, it's so great to be on your podcast. You were on my podcast, so I'm happy to be on yours. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you because I feel like the work that we do is parallel in so many ways. I focus a lot on this podcast about normalizing and supporting neurodiversity in, in families and education and clinical settings. And you focus on normalizing mental health needs of adults in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit about how this became your passion and your mission. You know, it sort of always has been. And life kept getting in the way for many years. So, mm -hmm. you know, being someone who has managed my own mental health pretty seriously since I was 19 years old, it's always been present in my life. And it's been a fascination. I, I did lots and lots of psychology in, in college and in graduate school, did a lot of organizational psychology, and also um, completed half of my master's in social work. So I did all the academic work, but life got in the way. I mean, my goal in my late 20s, after I realized that working in politics in corporate America wasn't for me, was to become a workplace therapist. Mm. But, you know, I just, when I was in my, when I was, you know, sort of heading into the last phase of my MSW, I got pregnant and um, it was 2008 and every, the economy was terrible. And, you know, basically I just could not afford $75,000 to go back to social work school. So went, started freelancing and started my business and, you know, sort of had this whole other amazing career. But the whole time I was writing and blogging about work and what it was like, especially if you're different at work. And so it all just kind of emerged organically that, you know, the more I talked about it, the more people liked it. And um, I, I really was experimenting with a lot of mediums. I started my first podcast in 2015 Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just built up to the anxious achiever, which is such an honor. I think that it's just such an important piece for so many people. You know, one of the things that I think is such an asset about the Internet and podcasts and everything as things have changed over the last decade or more 
is that we're able to find people who have similar experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, you were going through your master's of social work, so I've got my master's in counseling. And one of the therapeutic things that we would talk about is that feeling of universality, knowing that you're not alone and how powerful that can really be. I knew this from a very young age because my second job was at iVillage.com, which I don't know if any of you remember, but was Mm -hmm. during the message board era in the late 90s and early 2000s was the biggest site for women on the internet. And what I learned working at iVillage was women would connect over the most intimate topics, divorce, relationships, cancer, through message boards, and that tremendous communities were built through that, right? I mean, any of us who's been through something like Baby Center, Mm -hmm. we can relate. And then I was an early blogger. So I started blogging in late 2004 because I worked in politics. So I wrote about women in politics, and I worked with Blog Her, which was sort of the iVillage for the blog age. And my experience with online community was the most formative experience in my life because I was able to know that there were people out there on the internet who were just as weird as me, <laughs> right? Yes. Who liked, you know, those of us, those of us who find community online, you know, a lot of us are like, we, we, we're, we're, we're different. We, we don't, I always joke, we don't do small talk, right? Mm-hmm. And so I've known this now for, geez, over 20 years. And again, I, I consider it like the gift in my life. And my business, Women Online, was was actually sort of that business. We worked with women influencers, with women's communities, and we created social impact campaigns for amazing clients by amplifying women's voices online and getting that information to women where they hung out online. Mm -hmm. And so having that sense of community just was empowering both for you, but also for the people that were reading what you were writing. I guess through all of this, you were also just sharing about your experiences with with mental health things going on and anxiety. But I love also how through your work, you've also really focused on how anxiety specifically can be a strength that can be leveraged to help people find success. Can you talk a little bit about that process and kind of how you got to that point? Was it it always there or was that something that you had to kind of grow into and realize? It was something I always knew in my heart. Um, And being a nerdy person, I wanted to just sort of like try to do some work verifying it before I certainly wrote a book about it. But with the podcast, my goal with The Anxious Achiever was to find people who manage their mental health pretty intensively, but who have really big careers. I knew from my own experience, and just because I talked to so many people, because remember, I've been blogging about this stuff for over a decade at this point, 15 years, 16 years, that there were a lot of people like me who were really anxious, who were on medication, who were in therapy, who had diagnoses, who had diagnoses of depression, who had diagnoses of bipolar disorder, as I also do, OCD, who hated their mental illness, Mm. but also knew that it drove them. And this is especially true of anxiety. So many of us use our anxiety as a way of almost driving us. You know, I joke that anxiety is oxygen for many of us. And the fear, the beliefs that we hold, that we're not good enough, that we have to always be special, that bad things will happen if we don't work as hard as we can, can cause us to live extraordinary lives. It can also cause us to have mental health crises and burnout and emotional exhaustion, and it can harm our relationships and rob us of joy. And I was so fascinated by this duality because I lived it myself and I was meeting so many people who could relate that I wanted to tell the story of people who have big challenges, but also work through them and understand how it drives them. Yeah. Finding that balance between the struggles that come along with mental health needs, but also those benefits that can come out of them as well. Yeah. I mean, look, depression is not a benefit. Right. (laughs) I, I, I'm, that's the one that's like, everyone's like, really? I'm like, no, that depression sucks. Yeah, it's hard to find a, a strength to leverage out of feeling that low. Yeah, but you know, anxiety is such a complicated emotion because we really need anxiety, right? It's mm-hmm. kept us alive as a species and anxiety itself is not, I don't believe, bad or good. And the magic really lies in trying to understand why your anxiety is present 
getting the help you need, but also saying to your anxiety, like, what are you trying to tell me? Sometimes anxiety is just trying to tell you, like, you really care about this, like push through, Mm. give your anxiety a plan, I always say, and like, see where it takes you. So um, those of us who are more anxious by nature, we may not ever be able to cure ourselves, but we can certainly develop strengths and tools and strategies to deal and even use it. To kind of like funnel it into our goals Mm -hmm. without it becoming totally debilitating. I talked to two people this week who are on the autism spectrum. And they said, you know, they both said very similar things about what they saw as their superpowers. One said, you know, I am able to see problems and put in frameworks and organize and operationalize the ways to address those problems and challenges in a way that very few other people can. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was incredible. Like this person was basically saying like, I am able to create maps and structures and ways to address things because of my brain. And that is my superpower. And it's done very well for me. Now I'm terrible at a lot of other things <laughs> that people typically need to do for work. And I say that for myself, I am terrible at a lot of things. And I have failed and not done well at many jobs. But the things that I'm good at, I'm really, really good at. And I think that those of us who are neurodivergent and who sort of have the privilege and luck to stick with it and figure it out, you know, we really, we really kind of can get to that point. Definitely. And in recognizing, like you said earlier, the duality, I feel like probably a lot of our audience can relate to a lot of the things that you're, you're saying. And also one of the things I know just about talking to people is that a lot of people look back at their youth and realized as they've become adults, like how many things were already in play that have led them to where they are. Mm-hmm. I'm curious just a little bit about your own experience growing up, like when you were younger, you said that you really started to notice things going on in your late teens, maybe early 20s. But were there also things as a child or an early teen that you experienced that, that reflect back now and think about differently? Oh, gosh, 100 percent. I mean, I was my mother said I was clinically anxious when I was three years old. I had agoraphobia. <laughs> oh, wow. I had really terrible tantrums. Um, I mean, you and I have talked about this. Like I was, you know, cognitively gifted, mm-hmm. but also very, very high strung, intense, had a lot of social problems, just what there was a lot of drama. I I feel bad for my mother sometimes having been my mother because, wow, I was a lot. Mm -hmm. And of course, looking back, and I started having migraines at a very young age, like it just so many pieces. The other piece was that I, I happened to grow up in a household that was challenging. And I was a very hypervigilant child. From a young age, I felt very much like I had to take care of myself and my sister and sometimes my mom. And I was always adept at thinking ahead, scanning the environment for threats, you know, anxiety. And that that has been something that has been extremely difficult for me to let go of as an adult, but also something that has made me very successful. And again, it's that duality. It is exhausting to be hypervigilant. It is exhausting to always be waiting for the bad news and the other shoe to drop. But it has made me a really good entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's made me a really good strategist. Um, It's actually created empathy in me. Mm. So it's just very interesting to me to untangle all the pieces. And so now as a parent, you know, you, so you have a family full of a variety of neurodiverse <laughs> needs. And so oh yes, can you share a little bit about that experience and that journey and just how all of the work that you've done has also influenced how you understand and, and support those in your family? It's funny. Our colleague, Amanda Morin, who's how I know you, I think. Um, yes. She and I talked, and I actually know her through Blog Her. So there you go. Oh, that's funny. I don't know that I knew that. <laughs> oh, man. She's been online as long as I have. Mm-hmm. She said, you know, it's always so shocking to us as neurodivergent parents that we have kids. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we're like, how did this happen? <laughs> and you're like, uh, it's called 
genetics and also environment, right? Nature, nurture. And so, I, you know, for me, I have to have that moment every once in a while and laugh at myself. Um, but I also had a night, you know, a real aha moment just even a couple of years ago about how my anxiety was affecting my kids mm. and how they experience life. And that was very, very painful because I think that it had a really intense effect on them, um, as well as they had their own sort of genetic soup of special needs. So as a parent, I try to hold myself accountable and really take good care of my mental health I, I was extremely, I had a major depressive episode about a year and a half ago. I've only had a few in my life, thank God, that have been really life-stopping episodes of depression. And the thing that I felt worse about was that it was going to scare the heck out of my kids, and it really did. And as a mom, that's just the worst feeling in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I really try to take care of my mental health to show my kids what it means. I try to help them learn skills to take care of their mental health. But I also don't want it to be all about this stuff. You know, I really try not to, my career is very focused on this work, so I try not to always make it the focal point either because I don't think that's healthy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. Yeah, it, it's always this, um, well, for me personally, I feel like I'm constantly reminding people that even though I do this work and I do the trainings with educators and all of these other things, like I do not have it all figured out. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. day to day and, and raising kids and also not project our own stuff. I mean, that's the thing, right? That's the thing. And, and, and sometimes, you know, and I find this when I'm working with leaders um, in organizations where they're having all these great aha moments about their mental health and, and how they show up at work because of how their mental health is affecting them. And there's this temptation to see everything through that lens. Mm -hmm. Well, I realized what my anxiety was leading me to do. So you're probably doing this too, right? And um, and that's the thing is like people aren't therapists, right? We don't have those skills. We want to share our experiences. We We see the world the way we see it. And so I think when you're helping people talk about this stuff, in a, in a forum that is typically not reserved for talking about this stuff. It really is about helping people maintain boundaries and taking perspective so that their own experience doesn't color everything and that people feel really comfortable, you know, hopefully talking about sensitive stuff. Do you feel like sometimes you live in a bubble? <laughs> like, I feel like sometimes I'm always advocating for things and talking to people who who get it and who understand. And then and then like all of a sudden I'll like run into the real world, like something will happen and I'll be like, oh, this is not, we have so far to go with all of this. I know. I mean, I feel, um, I feel both. I feel very lucky because I actually, I, I work with such diverse organizations and people who, you know, I had this amazing guy who's a partner in a, an accounting firm reach out to me and he told me his story and what he's trying to do with, at his accounting firm. And, you know, it's it's like people who don't fit into the stereotype of people who are, quote, into mental health, mm -hmm. really showing up and saying, you know, this was powerful for me. I believe it could be powerful for the people who work for me. How do I do this work? I just, it sounds cheesy, but I I, I find it extremely inspiring. I find it amazing that, and I think this is the most fabulous thing, again, bringing it back to the internet and having a platform, is that you just never know who's going to respond. And I think that that's, that's a mistake that we make, I think, and that even practitioners make in judging who's going to respond based on where they live or what they look like or what their background is, um, because you truly never know. And you have to be really always consciously aware of the fact that you don't know in order to question those beliefs and make sure that you're not falling into some of those traps. Yep. I mean, I trust me, as a progressive who has worked in progressive and democratic politics and issue advocacy for decades now, I have worked with so many organizations 
who on the outside are the organizations that you would think get it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they don't. And then I have worked with organizations and met organizations who you'd be like, that's a terrible place. Mm -hmm. They're patriarchal. They're racist. They don't talk about anything. And you're like, no, it's not true. So, Well, as I mean, the whole conversation that we're having today is also just about this process of self-discovery that as adults, as parents, as as workers, as leaders, whatever we are, there's this ongoing process. There's actually this quote from a psychologist that I love, Alfred Adler, all of life is a striving for perfection. And he's not really talking about perfection necessarily like as in being perfect, but just growth. Mm-hmm. That's part of humanity is wanting to improve oneself and wanting to to be better. It's our relentless drive, you know, and... Um, I think that the problem that I have on this front, especially, you know, I work with companies, I work in leadership culture, and most of the people and organizations I work with have done tons of leadership training, right? They've read the books, they've been to the courses, they've been to the conferences, they listen to the podcasts. And so they're they're very keyed in to the idea that self-improvement is important, right? Mm -hmm. That leaders should be constantly striving to be better. But they don't use the scary words. And this is my issue with leadership culture right now is that we're obsessed with self-optimization. You know, we're obsessed with getting better. We're obsessed to leading into your growth edge and all that. But we don't talk about the scary, dark things like I have anxiety. I have depression. I grew up in a traumatic household and it is showing up in the way that I manage people. Enough. We couch it with words like mental performance and mental fitness and, you know, all this stuff. And I think we just need to get more comfortable in a safe way, obviously, because this stuff can be very intense. But we need to look inside ourselves and, and look at the darker, more vulnerable places. Yeah. I want to make a parallel here and see if you have any thoughts about the connection between the work that you do in the workplace and then also just the educational world and especially like as it relates to advocacy, you know, as a parent. Do you have any other observations just about I have so many. The work that our students are doing, you know, our kids are doing. So, you know, I have I have a professional observation and then my own personal observation. You know, when I when I owned my business, we worked in a lot of educational spaces. We worked with clients as diverse as the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, American Academy of Pediatrics, Centers for Disease Control. We worked on a big national campaign to bring social emotional learning into public schools. We worked for sex ed clients. We worked with learning disability focused advocacy groups. I have seen both the incredible growth in this space. Um and the normalizing of what it means to be well-rounded and have an, a growth mindset and teach kids from very young ages essential skills like how to control their bodies by breathing, right, and calm their, calm their emotions and understand what their emotions are. There's so much good stuff happening and there's been a lot of advocacy. Like I think you look at the autism space And there has been a tremendous amount of advocacy. You know, I live in Massachusetts and there is a law that autistic kids get what they need in public schools. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. I think obviously now we're seeing a huge stripping back Mm -hmm. of those advances from a political level. And I think when it comes to youth mental health, we really have very few resources as we're learning. Yeah. And there needs to be a lot more advocacy you know, for kids who are needing help as so many kids are. So I am so grateful that many children are learning mind-body connections at a young age. I know my kids are in our public schools. I'm terrified about what's happening in politics to strip those rights away. Certainly also when it comes to diversity and our identities. Um, And I also think that when it comes to kids and mental health and the huge social experiment that has been social media, we're we're really not doing great. Just earlier this week, there's been a lot in the news about the impact of social media and teen mental health specifically. Yeah. And I don't know, I just thought of this as we're sitting here talking, but 
it's interesting to think about what the impact will be in 10 years, in 20 years in the workplace, like as those teens become adults, but they've grown up with this. You know, I wonder, it's scary to think about right now. Well, it's scary to think about even projecting it into the future. But where are we headed, I guess, with all of it? I don't think we're headed anywhere good. Yeah, I really, I really don't. I I think that another piece of this that doesn't get talked about enough and is an easy talking point for people to who are against this learning is to say, well, you're just raising kids to be too soft. You're raising kids to just like mm. live in their feelings, mm-hmm. right? I hear this a lot about Gen Z in the workforce. They're just, they live in their feelings and they're just not tough enough. And I do think that's a danger. I mean, I think you know, when when I say learn how your anxiety is showing up for you at work, how it's affecting you, how you're acting it out, I'm not saying fall prey to your anxiety and don't push yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm saying do the work. Right. You know, like we, we need to learn resiliency. And so I'm, I think we in the field aren't great at communicating that piece of it all the time. And we, we make ourselves almost more open to criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've, trust me, I've helped clients manage this criticism online. And so, you know, it's not about, it's not about creating a generation of people who are just constantly in their feelings and have no real world, world skills. Quite the contrary, I hope. I think you're absolutely right. Because when I work with my clients, one of the things I'll talk to them about, you know, when they're feeling anxious is like the number one thing that your anxiety wants you to do is avoid whatever it is that's causing anxiety. Exactly. But when you do that, it just gets bigger. You have to find ways to work through it, work around, you know, whatever it might be. And that is where the growth comes from, where, where the success comes from, because you can't just avoid all of the things like that just isn't no reality. No. And, and that's where the framework of saying, could I even use this anxiety is helpful because if, you know, I mean, if you're, and again, I'm not talking about clinical anxiety where you are having panic attacks and you, I'm not talking about that. Right. But, you know, when you're super anxious about something and you feel nauseous and you feel like you cannot possibly do something and every piece of you wants to just hide under the covers, that is a time to talk to your anxiety and say, like, I get it. This is, we're really scared about this. Like, we have a huge amount of emotional investment in this outcome. There are big stakes, and we feel like the stakes are really big. But is this something that I care about? Is this something that's important to me? Yes? Okay, then. All right. And then, you know, what I do is I literally, I will say to my anxiety, like, let's make a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, like, can I use the energy you're giving me? You know, and again, that takes skill, but I think that that's a place where it's more comfortable for people to get to than, than I'm never going to feel anxiety again. Sometimes when I'm talking again to my young clients, this is not necessarily anxiety related, but it kind of is, but they feel like if they're not happy all the time, that something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like, no, sometimes it's just like, okay, okay is, that's pretty good. Like, yep. you know, if you feel okay, most of the time, that's, you know, something you can manage, you know, and going back to the social media piece, I almost wonder how much of that is an influencing factor that feels like everybody else is happy all the time. And that's just not reality. I think to me, one of the insid- most insidious pieces of social media, and, and maybe this is more about adults than kids, is it gives you the sense that every day is a day to be conquered. Mm. Every day is a day to do something and share what you're doing. And, you know, sometimes days are just days. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with this myself. You know, every day is a day to have an achievement. Every day is a day to put out a post that people respond to or get praise online. And that's a really challenging, challenging trap And what I have had to learn is to have a practice of like, some days you're not going to move the ball forward, Nora. Mm. Some days it's just going to be a day and you're going to do your work and it's going to be tedious and people are going to annoy you and and you're going to feel doubt and you're going to feel anxiety and you you cannot run away from that. Yeah, I agree. So Nora, I'm really grateful for our conversation today. I just have one last question for you as we wrap up. If you were talking to, let's say, another parent, but someone who's trying to balance all of the stress of their own job, 
and the anxiety of not being good enough and, you know, the pressures of being a parent. What is it that you would want them to hear? What's the message that you would like to share? You're not alone. You are not alone. And even the people that you look to, because when we're anxious and we're feeling unsure, we compare ourselves to other people, right? The people that you are comparing yourself to and making yourself feel bad, you don't know their story, right? You don't know. They may look at you and feel the same way. Um, I think it's just really helpful. And trust me, I have the evidence. I have talked to hundreds and hundreds of people about this stuff. You just never know what someone's inside looks like, and it probably doesn't match their outside. Maura Aarons Mealy, author of The Anxious Achiever and host of the podcast by the same name. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Emily. The point of the neurodiversity movement is to move away from pathologizing the various ways that brains are wired. And Mora's message about accessing anxiety as a strength fits neatly into this discussion. There's a threshold of pressure or stress that can help us rise to the challenge in many situations. And the more we can recognize that overthinking and hypervigilance can, at times, be an asset, the less debilitating it becomes. There's this very fine line between letting others or ourselves experience a healthy amount of anxiety and the flip side of debilitating clinical anxiety. But normalizing and destigmatizing feelings of anxiety can help. It can help us self-advocate. It can help us recognize when it's time to push through anxiety and when it's time to retreat. And it can help us accept ourselves even when we feel stressed or scared. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. See you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks again to Maura Ahrens Mealy. You can find links to her work and the Anxious Achiever podcast in the show notes. One more thing, if you happen to be a mental health professional and would like to attend Emily's continuing education course, Assessing and Treating Suicidality and Self-Injury in Neurodivergent Clients, it's happening live Tuesday morning, June 20th. It's a two-hour course, and you can sign up to join us virtually by clicking the link in the show notes. It will also be available in the future on our learning platform, the Neurodiversity University. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media director is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, say it with me. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.